Good morning to my favorite brood of vipers. How you doing? <laughs> These passages that Victor just read um, had me thinking about tree chopping this week. And sometimes tree chopping sounds like bad news, threatening even. It brings up an image for me of like a beautiful redwood chopped down in the middle of the night. But sometimes things need to be chopped down. Forests have to be thinned to be healthy, to prevent fire. Proverbially, I think we have a lot of chopping to do. We have systems and structures that aren't working very well in our world anymore, if they ever did. Voices of hate are getting amplified. Billionaires have more money than they could spend in 20 lifetimes and others can't afford housing or health care or safety. We need a new paradigm for the lion and the lamb, don't we? I wonder if the axe against the tree that John mentions is a promise, though, and not the threat that it sounds like. Back when I was doing youth ministry, I took a group of desert-dwelling children from Albuquerque up to Sitka, Alaska, to work at Sheldon Jackson College for a week. We had a great time. But one of the jobs that the college had for the group to do was to take down a bunch of trees that were encroaching on the campus. It was a reasonable request in Alaska. But the kids from New Mexico wouldn't do it. They lived in a place where trees were rare and were valuable. And the shade from cottonwoods made a real difference in the heat of an Albuquerque summer. They treasured trees and they didn't want to participate in their destruction. So we had to sit down and talk about the difference in location, about how there really were too many trees invading the campus, and how Sitka had, a different, had many different issues than Albuquerque did. And so off they went to clear the trees. I realize I probably would have had better volunteers if I told them they could be like John the Baptizer, yelling at the trees, repent ye pine forest, even now the ax is at your root. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down. Everybody wants to be an old school prophet some days, don't they? Sometimes things need to come down. And sometimes the ax against the tree is a promise and not a threat. I know John the Baptist is not the most approachable or personable biblical character. He could use some social skills. Calling people broods of vipers is not perhaps the conventional way to win hearts and minds. But people flocked to hear him. Despite his appearance, despite his rhetoric, they flocked from all of Judea, it says. All of Jerusalem came to the, to the wilderness to be baptized by him in the Jordan. Even the Sadducees and the Pharisees, people who could have easily had their baptisms of repentance handled from the comfort of their religious structures that they oversaw, even they went to the wilderness. John is a reminder that when it comes right down to it, people would really rather hear that inconvenient truth than platitudes. We seek authenticity even when we wish we could find meaning in hollow happiness. And we know he's right when we hear his lectures. We hear the admonishment that the ax is against the tree and we think of what needs to be chopped down. Or maybe we don't. Maybe we prefer the forest we know, even if it's getting a little crowded and the dead wood makes it difficult to walk under the canopy the way we used to. Maybe like the Pharisees and Sadducees, we hide behind the trees and say, well, we might be dead wood that isn't bearing fruit, but we're the trees that Abraham planted and you can't get rid of us. But John tells them that God is able to turn rocks lying in a riverbed into children of Abraham. The traditions that matter so much, the connection to Abraham, to our past, to our ancestors, is good and real and important. But if we think our connection to tradition is more important than bearing good fruit so we can carry that tradition into the future, John reminds us of our folly. Because the stakes are high. God has work for us to do in this world. We have to be trees bearing fruit of the Spirit. And if we're not willing to do that, God's going to plant a new crop of trees. We're all gathered here in the midst of a busy holiday season and a weekend that's been full of rain and cold temperatures because I think we're drawn to John's message. We want to be trees that bear good fruit. And we know we don't always do that. We are people who make mistakes. We are people who lose focus. We get our priorities in the wrong order. We mistake privilege for divine right. 
And each week in worship, we pray that prayer of confession. And we lift our voices together to acknowledge that we have not lived as God has called us to live. And we repent each week of our mistakes. Together, we announce forgiveness and we pass the peace to each other, celebrating the gift of community that allows us to come together and to be authentic and true and who we are. And I know some of you don't love the confession. It can be seen as a little depressing, but I would come to worship each week just for that moment in worship. There's something freeing about being honest about my failures. It's liberating to hear other people's voices raised together, to know that I'm not alone, to receive God's grace and mercy together. We join our voices with the generation of people before us and with those who will follow. We are called to repentance, to acknowledging that we haven't lived as we've been called to live. But this isn't about guilt or about trying to make people feel unworthy. The repentance is actually an act of hope. By repenting, we as individuals and as a community come before God and each other and acknowledge that we believe in something more than ourselves. We believe in God's kingdom. And we believe there's a better and a more just way of being and of treating each other and of living together than we can make happen on our own. We believe God can do more with our lives than we can imagine. And so I see this act of confession and the assurance of pardon in John the Baptist's role in the Advent journey. Because if all you had was John yelling at you in the desert, that would be kind of depressing. If all we had was confession without the assurance of pardon, where would our hope be? So the axe against the tree is a promise because John goes from chopping and starts talking about Jesus. And that's why we turn to John the Baptist each Advent season. He recognized something new was happening in the person of Jesus, and he knew we had to get ready for it. Because the redemption of the world that happened in the person of Jesus of Nazareth is really good news, and it turned the whole world upside down. It showed us that the God who created the universe is still active in the act of creating now, and that's why stumps aren't all that bad. As Isaiah describes the vision of a new world, he starts with this line, a shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse and a branch will grow out of its roots. This particular language, of course, makes us think of a family tree and not just any family tree, but the royal line of King David, the son of Jesse. But David's reign didn't work out so well, if you've read your Bible. His line lived on, but his family's reign was rather short-lived. Jesus' genealogy connects him back to David, but Isaiah reminds us that the family tree is more of a stump and a shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse. If you look at a stump like the one on the bulletin cover, it doesn't matter how deep its roots are, it doesn't matter how long the tree lived, it will never again be the tree that it was. Tree stumps are not where you look for new life. Tree stumps are where you see what is missing, what used to be, and what we've lost. And it's okay to grieve what's been lost or what needs to be chopped down. But Isaiah invites us to consider stumps in a new way. At the end of um, chapter 10, before our verse picked up this morning, he writes, Look, the sovereign, the Lord of hosts, will lop the boughs with terrifying power, and the tallest trees will be cut down, and the lofty will be brought low. God will hack down the thickets of the forest with an axe and Lebanon with its majestic trees will follow, fall, and a shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. From the stump, from the dead end, from the ruined forest will grow up a leader with a spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And the root of Jesse will stand as a signal to the world, we're told. But notice what kind of a signal it is. It's not a giant behemoth sequoia tree that comes out of the stump of Jesse. It's a shoot, a fragile sign of life and beauty. A shoot growing out of a stump is a reminder of both the tenacity and the tenuousness of life. Fear and selfish concern will not prevail no matter how much it may seem to be winning in the moment because life is tenacious. Isaiah didn't know anything about Jesus of Nazareth. He was not a fortune teller who was predicting the future in a magical way. 
He was a prophet of God, a person called by God to proclaim God's uh, kingdom, God's promise, and God's hope for a future. But the people who met Jesus and who heard him speak, who saw him heal, who watched him stand up and speak truth to power, who heard Jesus preach a message of repentance and of God's grace, all of these people heard Jesus and they thought of Isaiah. Jesus embodied for them the message of hope they had heard in Isaiah's writing, and John recognized it too. Prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. And so this second week of Advent, we are here to prepare, to repent, to prepare for the redemption of the world that we know comes in Jesus. And the image of stumps and ruined forests and dead ends are just a point of the journey. They're not the ending when God is telling the story. Our theme for Advent is generations to generations, and I think about the generations before us who witnessed endings that created our beginnings. In my life, my birth mother surely felt some sort of ending when I was born and she gave me up for adoption. What was a stump in the forest of her life is also what has allowed me to grow and to flourish and to live. And I have great compassion for her and gratitude for the life that I'm living. I'm also doing what I can do to heal things so that my children's struggles will be different than mine. Because as Joanne talked about last week, we are called to care for those who will follow us more than we are called to please our ancestors who came before. And that got me thinking about the people who came before us at Calvary and how well they provided for us even at the expense of what their ancestors might have thought. This church is in its third location in its hundred and whatever year history. And I think about our ancestors who made the decision to put the proverbial ax to their church buildings, which they surely loved as much as we love this one. God was calling them to a new neighborhood in their city and they tore down their church and moved it up here. With hindsight, after the earthquake, I'm sure that they saw that they had made the right decision But in the moment when things were being dismantled, I bet there was grief and anxiety. Are we doing the right thing? We continue our part of the work and we start clearing the ground and cleaning up our messes and planting new trees. Our work is different than God's, of course. We can prepare soil and we can nurture new growth when it appears. But when out of a stump, we see a shoot emerging from the dead we will be reminded that it is God who does things we cannot do. And so we, that engenders our hope. It reminds us to continue. Maya Angelou wrote a poem called Continue, and here's a part of it. My wish for you is that you continue. Continue to be who and how you are, to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Continue to allow humor to lighten the burden of your tender heart. Continue in a society dark with cruelty to let people hear the grandeur of God and the peals of your laughter. Continue to let your eloquence elevate the people to heights they had only imagined. Continue to remind people that each is as good as the other and that no one is beneath nor above you. Continue to remember your own young years and look with favor upon the lost and the least and the lonely. Continue to put the mantle of your protection around the bodies of the young and defenseless. Continue to take the hand of the despised and the diseased and walk proudly with them in the high street. Some might see you and be encouraged to do likewise. Continue to plant a public kiss of concern on the cheek of the sick and the aged and the infirm and count that as a natural action to be expected. Continue to let gratitude be the pillow upon which you kneel to say your nightly prayer and let faith be the bridge you build to overcome evil and welcome good. And so I invite you on this journey through Advent toward Christmas to notice the stumps, to recognize that that ax may not be such a bad thing because where we see endings, God is doing a beginning. We're invited to join in the work of the kingdom, bearing good fruit for the world, and so we prepare. We chop away the things that no longer give life, that hold us back from where God is calling us. 
we prepare the way. God is still at work in our world, creating where we only see endings. May it be so. Amen. I'd like to invite up Susan Hempstead, Elder for Stewardship, to talk, to give us